So today I want to talk about a, a star cluster, it's an open star cluster called Westerland 1, named after a guy called Bengt Westerland who discovered it in the 1960s. Had Messier had infrared vision, it would have leapt out as being one of his top non-comets in his catalogue. But because he was looking in the optical, it's one that actually has been hidden in plain view for many decades really. So Westerland 1 is probably the most massive young star cluster in the Milky Way that we know about. And yet, really, it was, it's been hard to, to observe because of that, there's always dust in the way. So to give you kind of an idea about why that is, here's, here's a view that was taken with a, a telescope in Chile at La Silla Observatory. And this is an optical image of a field of the Milky Way taking it in invisible light. You could go, here's a bright star, here's lots of stars, but you wouldn't necessarily see a star cluster there. And that's invisible light. Now in red light, you can maybe go, oh, okay. It's clearly there, and if you go to even longer wavelengths where the dust is less absorbent, it really is there. Yeah, and this is when Westerland discovered it, he went, it's a very red cluster. It either means it's got lots of very red stars in it, or it's got lots of dust towards it. And so when we tend to show pretty pictures of clusters, we do a composite image. And so taking, combining those three images produces this. And so this is a combined image of Westerland 1. All the stars in the cluster are these kind of reddy orangey things, but most of the reddy orange things here are actually really very blue things, but the light's being absorbed in the blue, so they look red. So in fact, if you went in a, in a spaceship and you got to, be, got to be there, there would be incredibly blue, incredibly bright stars. And it's just the dust that's got in the way. So it's, it's young, which means any star up to about 30 times the mass of the sun are still existing. So it's got this crazy zoo of all these different massive stars, so red supergiants, yellow supergiants, all these massive stars at various stages of evolution. A decade ago, when we pointed actually a, an X-ray telescope, at uh, Westerland 1, we found a very bright X-ray source, and that X-ray source turns out to be a neutron star. So in fact, massive stars with masses of 30, 40 times the mass of the sun can, in some circumstances, produce neutron stars. This is a typical neutron star, but one that was left behind when a really massive star blew up. And so here we have the optical view of our star cluster taken with our ESA telescopes in Chile. And then on the right, is now an X-ray view. And there's lots of X-ray sources in there, but one of them has no optical counterpart. This thing with the arrow pointing to it, with this long telephone number. And that's the neutron star. And this is a very young neutron star. It's only probably 10,000 years old. So 10,000 years ago, a massive star blew up, leaving behind a neutron star. And it's a, it's a very unusual type of neutron star. So very few star clusters, young star clusters, host pulsars. And this is, a, this is an extreme type of pulsar called a magnetar. Magnetars have crazily strong magnetic fields, and so the way that radio astronomers kind of show properties of pulsars is through what's called a PP dot diagram. And so I'm gonna show you a PP dot diagram. On the x-axis, it's a rotational period. So the shortest periods of pulsars is about a millisecond. Normal ones, you know, rotation rates maybe 10 times a second, only 10 times a second. And then the slow ones rotate for a second or two. And then the one with the weird unit, this P dot part, because they're such accurate chronometers, you can actually get a really accurate way of how that period is changing with time. And the units of those are seconds per second. So most pulsars that we know about in the Milky Way sit in this kind of cloud here. And when they get older, most pulsars kind of go towards this cloud, and then we can't detect them. This is this graveyard where they end up. Magnetars sit way up here. Although the spin periods are quite slow, they have crazy high magnetic fields, and no one knows why. There's only three magnetars in star clusters in the Milky Way. One's in Westerland 1, and there are two other star clusters, which are pretty young, which have got magnetars. Two of the three ones in clusters, where you can get an age, and therefore a mass of the star, are in pretty young clusters, so come from 30, 40 solar mass stars. One, maybe more like a 15 solar mass star. So these are kind of a crazily high magnetic fields. These are even crazier by a factor of a thousand compared to the normal crab pulsar type things. Could we live near a magnetar? What if the sun was a magnetar? Mm. Now that would be very bad. Very, very bad. There was another magnetar in the Milky Way that had like an earthquake, a little shudder, and there was a pulse of radiation given out about 20 years ago from that. This is at 25,000 light years away. It caused the Earth's magnetosphere to wobble from a tiny quake in a magnetar on the other side of the Milky Way. If you didn't mind about the actual magnetic field, it looks like a normal pulsar. So it's basically a city-sized neutron star, incredibly, incredibly dense, made of neutrons, but one which in general is rotating slower than a normal pulsar, 
but it's the magnetic field that makes it so unusual. It's quite a privilege to be on the summit and there won't be many more people on this summit because when they come around to actually build the ELT, they're going to actually blow the summit up in a way. They have to flatten all this. They're going to lower the mountain a bit and make a nice big flat platform for the ELT.